Hey, Brassfax here, doing another one of these preparedness uh, videos. It's worth noting for some people that view these things as um, wish fulfillment or fantasy, it's worth noting we don't prepare because we want something to happen. We prepare because we think something might happen and we don't want to be cut on uh, the wrong foot. If nothing happens, then we are glad. And if something happens, we are prepared. It's just something, I don't know, to me that was a bit confusing. A lot of people view this as uh, fantasy. And if it ends up being fantasy, which it very well may be, then that's a good thing, right? Uh, but discussing the possibility of something like this happening, well, that's just a part of being an adult and uh, game planning what might happen into the future. I game planned a lot of things, not just preparedness, like, hey, how am I going to finance a house? Should I buy a house? Where should I buy a house? What do I want to do with my career? So on and so forth. I don't upload those videos because you guys don't care about my, you know, that kind of stuff for me personally. So I upload this because it's relevant to where the channel is, right? It's a preparedness channel. Are we going to hit long-term civil unrest? Probably not, but it's a probably not. Not a for sure not. And we are entering a time in history where it would be foolish to put your foot down and say with absolutely certainty something's not going to happen. So, while I don't think it's likely that it will occur, I still think it's plausible that it will occur, hence this video and my preparedness. Today, we're going to talk about, and by we, I mean mostly me, and then you guys later in the comments, are going to talk about long-term civil unrest. Two things. I've already talked about minor civil unrest, which to me is the terminology I use to define, let's just say, the George Floyd riots. They were absolutely intense, but they were very much a flash in the pan. For me, long-term civil unrest is a little different. Um, will it be as intense? Yes, it'll have periods of extreme intensity and then lower intensity, uh, but that'll be determined by what the catalyst for the long-term civil unrest is. It's also worth noting, number two, um, Civil unrest, and the term long-term civil unrest, minor, major, whatever, super arbitrary, like most things in political science or whatever you want to classify this as. Uh, so I'm going to be using my terminology, long-term civil unrest. This may not link up with other terminologies of what long-term civil unrest might mean. According to some people, we've been in long-term civil unrest for the last 15 years. For others, we haven't even gotten started yet. Before going further, it's very important to say for the first time in this series, but certainly not the last time, we will be entering the land of, for the lack of a better term, make-believe, prediction, and guesswork. Unlike the topics I've covered so far, this isn't something that has happened in the United States in recent history. I've talked to several people that have deployed, some historian friends, as well as me personally being a budget historian, a uh, political science major. Yes, I have two degrees. Yes, I wasted my 20s. And, and we've tried to kind of substantiate a lot of these claims air quotes but ultimately it's all still guesswork and your guess is as good as mine uh, me you and everyone else are going to get a large percentage of this wrong the goal is just to try to get enough of it right that we have a good bedrock looking forward to kind of make some plans right not all plans will be useful and not all plans will do much but some of them hopefully will and we can increase our preparedness level or at least just have the thought in our head so we don't get blindsided if something like this may actually do happen. Unlike other scenarios, we have to kind of set the stage what is long-term or major civil unrest and what leads to long-term major civil unrest. There are so many ways that it could happen in the United States and elsewhere. Historically, periods of extreme civil unrest, there, there's just as many reasons for civil unrest to occur as instances of major civil unrest, right? It's almost unique in every scenario. Anything from worsening conditions to improving conditions. So going back over it, I actually ended up spending something like 10, almost 15 minutes discussing two real world scenarios where long-term civil unrest either happened or are ongoing. But ultimately, it doesn't really matter that this stuff has occurred. All that matters is that we think this might occur in the United States. So I cut that out to keep this video shorter, and I'll just list an example of how I think it might happen in the United States. For America, I'll uh, list a very specific variant. There are tons of ways that can lead to this, but I'll list one that I think is mostly somewhat likely. So I think the continued freefall of the economy, the quality of life, and the American dream, either actually or perceived, will cause the buildup of long-term civil unrest. And we have the good 
the like the matchbox ready and set up and now we just need a catalyst let me get into that catalyst americans have a well most western societies have a minimum expectation of quality of life and the rulers for the lack of a better term right the, the governing bodies have their mandate to rule kind of come from upholding this right that's why economy is always such a big part in terms of elections right how are you going to improve my life now and into the future and when that quality of life begins to degrade noticeably not only are the far right and the far left who cares about politics here not only are the extremes going to get upset but the air quotes normies in the middle are going to begin to get upset and when those people get upset that's when you get true long-term sustainable uh, civil unrest Reality is, everyone, but especially those people in the middle, have been going through a long and dark tunnel with this pandemic, and there is an expectation of a light at the end of the tunnel, and that light is getting awfully close. We're basically finishing up. Hypothetically, or metaphorically, we're at the point where those people are basically expecting um, President Biden to get on an aircraft carrier and say, mission accomplished, we beat COVID. And then afterwards, we have a full expectation of returning to normally, cheap ammo prices, booming economy, non-ridiculous housing prices, steaks that don't cost $20 uh, for a New York strip. No, those weren't specific to me. Why are you asking? This pandemic has hit all of us hard, some more than the others. I don't know a single person that isn't looking forward to or the expecting the return to semi-normalcy or complete normalcy 2019, basically. Here's the thing, though. When we get to that light at the end of the tunnel, what if that light turned out to be fake and we just entered an even deeper tunnel? Metaphors aside, what if we went through this entire pandemic, the, the frustration, the whatever that uh, related to you, right? We don't want to get into politics here, but we went through this unemployment, inflated stock market, housing, yada, yada, yada. What if we went through all of this and we finished COVID and that was just the appetizer and the main course of pain is here? Right. Humans can only hold out hope for so long, and regardless if this is the leader's fault or not, if it turns out COVID was just a pretext to a much worse long-term you know, downturn, people are going to start getting really, really, really upset. And this is, in my theory, the, 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 the prelude to long-term civil unrest. And the reality is, it is looking potentially likely that we're not actually entering an era of econ economic boom. We're actually entering an area of extreme economic downturn. How that might happen, I have my theories. Don't really need to get into it today, but I feel like the, the, the foundation is set for a much worse decade than we started with. So what does it look like? Well, the defining feature of long-term civil unrest is something that ebbs and flows. Right? It's not always going to be at maximum intensity. Right? It will go up and down. Some people say we've already entered a period of civil unrest, and maybe we have. It's really hard to tell in the moment. But generally speaking, compared to other large-scale civil unrests, Argentina, Mexico, Venezuela, just to name a few on this side of the, uh, the hemisphere, we haven't quite seen anything yet. So what will we see in long-term civil unrest? Well, we've seen some of it, right? Demonstrations of, that are demonstrating something, generally probably frustration with the government, that turned violent with increasing regularity. We see targeting of the haves versus the have-nots, usually racial or economical, almost always socioeconomic, with increasing regularity. We see the targeting of businesses, and not only Walmarts, but also just small businesses because business in general are viewed as the haves. As the situation gets worse, many will enter the, the mental mindset, either temporarily or long-term, of fuck the system and the system has nothing to do or benefit me anymore. We saw the beginnings of this, but a lot of these people were turned back into the system. But with a worsening scenario, we could see a lot of people permanently entering that state and they become essentially professional, you know, civil unresters for the lack of a better term. And when this occurs, this is like the tick box mark. When people exit society and don't feel a reason to participate in society at a large enough scale, this historically, uh, is a thing that's studied and this is where things get bad because once that happens we go from a quick release pressure valve that lets off steam every two to three years to a constant pressure outflow uh, for these individuals and they technically infect other individuals and that's when it gets really really bad that's where we get targeted violence we get targeting of groups we get 
daylight murders, looking at a real life semi-historical context, we can look at something like Venezuela because it checks a lot of boxes. Is it the same? No. But it checks a lot of boxes to give us some of a baseline to go forward in this discussion. Is it a rich nation? Yeah, it's actually really rich. One of the richest uh, post-World War II. But what does it look like now? Is it inherently poor? No, I just said it's actually a really rich nation. Low infrastructure? No, it's very well established. You could have probably called it a first world nation in the 60s, well on its way to be very successful in the post-World War II liberal trade order. However, for reasons that are not the subject of this video, it began a rapid downward slide um, in the 70s and for sure in the 2000s. And at this point, many people would consider the nation of Venezuela either at or approaching failed nation state status. And it's basically just propped up by having a lot of resources, specifically oil. There are a lot of parallels we can draw from that to the United States, though not nearly as serious yet. Regardless, the United States has been on a slow brew for quite some time now, with the occasional flare-ups with the recent pandemic. But once you get those full-time, you know, civil unresters, which we haven't really seen yet, we, we saw like semi-full-time for about six months, but once we get those full-time instigators, people that have left the system, have lost complete confidence in society and uh, just are kind of burned by it, right? They can't make any money. They can't exist in the society. And as a larger percentage of population is made up by these people, we're going to see protests turn violent nearly all the time. We're going to see targeted violences towards the haves versus the have-nots. We'll probably see racial targeting, uh, both sides. Uh, we'll see a lot of targeting of government employees, which is a thing that actually occurs in Venezuela, from what I understand, with regularity. It also refers to contract workers, right? Like people just working on the roads, the power lines, whatever. We're going to see a lot of targeting of these uh, individuals as the frustration is sort of let out. We're going to see the wealth distribution further get segmented, right? As it becomes harder and harder to exist in a society that is on a downward spiral, relatively speaking, it's a zero-sum game. The people at the top are going to have an increasingly easier time accumulating wealth if they don't already. I'm not talking about like gang-like activity, though it certainly looks gang-like from the outside. I'm talking about small groups of individuals, uh, kind of almost in the spur of the moment, committing violence against another group of people. And this is a hallmark of long-term systemic civil unrest. And this is what we're talking about today. This typically requires a very large group of oppressed people, uh, either socioeconomic, racial, or generally both. There are a number of examples you could probably think of right now that hit that exactly on the mark. All right, I don't want to get into it any further because even as a political scientist, the best political scientists are right roughly 60-65% of the time, and I am by far not the best. But I just tried to lay some groundwork there so you can have an idea of where I'm coming at for preparing for something like this. All right, let's begin preparing for this. Remember the context here. We're trying to get through the above scenario, but we're still basically living, air quotes, normal life, except everything has been jacked up on the gray scale of misery. Power, water, gas, work. <laughs> They're all still there and an integral part of life, though some of it may be intermittent. So we're doing basically all we're doing for our, air quotes, normal times, but the expectation and prevalence of violence have shot up through the roof. So how do we aim to kind of mitigate this from the tactical side of things? Well, remember that conversation about handguns I keep having. It's back. Imagine you go to the gas station with your, you know, your nice looking car, not completely beat down. And instead of daydreaming about the days where gas was only $5 a gallon, well, Instead, your spidey senses tingle off as a bunch of dudes approach you from what you thought was your blind spot, but you were paying attention, and obviously are closing the distance in an aggressive manner. You begin to think about, hey, maybe I shouldn't have gone to the shitty part of the neighborhood, before realizing the entire nation is now the shitty part of the neighborhood. Uh, donning your T-Rex arms lightweight plate carrier kit is not going to save you, your handgun is gonna save you here, and that's how you're gonna solve problems like this. Go to the local Costco, and those that last of the muffin six pack is being sold, and a kerfuffle breaks out in the chocolate favored section and people are getting shanked, pistol's gonna save you. You're leaving work and you're in your parking lot and 
and a disgruntled employee or someone that just thinks you are well off decides, hey, you know what, you're the target, Pistol's going to get you out of that scenario. You're going to a bar because fuck it, you still want to live your life. Well, Pistol's going to get you out of that scenario. Though, seriously, don't go to bars. They're super lame. Uh, learn how to make your own drinks. Seriously. $12 old fashions don't need to be a thing. You can do it for a tenth of that cost. What was I talking about again? Oh, right. Civil unrest and fucking pistols. So, handgun. If you're not extremely comfortable with one, you need to unfuck your training priority right now. But I've covered handguns a lot, so I'm going to move on. I'm going to shill for some PDWs here. PDWs, or weapons, stocked weapons or braced weapons with an overall length below 15 inches, are the answer to the question of what if I want more than a handgun. They are concealable on body, above the waistline, and under a shirt. I don't care how small your law folder 300 blackout is, it's not small enough. So it doesn't even get to come to the party where PDWs and pistols are invited to. Remember, we're still living our life. Just bringing an AR-15 with a suppressor everywhere is not necessarily a smart idea, nor is it a practical one. Every night you turn on the news, and more and more people are getting shwacked in your town, city, or whatever, to the point where they're probably just showing the numbers or just emitting it entirely. Suddenly in this scenario, the desire for a weapon that is 10 times easier to shoot has more capacity while still being on the body makes a lot of sense. Combine some soft armor in there, and your odds of survivability have actually gone up a noticeable percentage. This is why I'm a very big fan of ultra-compact PDW stocked or braced weapons like the Flux Raider or the uh, TP9 or whatever that uh, Strike Industries thing is. We'll see on that one. On the note of firearms, ammo reserves. The best time to buy ammo was, well, not yesterday, but you know what I mean, in 2019. There's a good chance we will enter a relative 2019 again where ammo is cheap and accessible. Maybe we are in that, air quotes, 2019. So my, now might be the time you want to be buying ammo. That's the thing. It's preparedness. You, you do it incrementally and slowly. But the end goal should be at some point you want a large stock of ammunition. And I'm not talking about a thousand rounds to get you through the boogaloo. I'm talking about a large amount of ammunition. 10,000 plus per caliber. Why? Are you going to Alamo it? No. Maybe. I mean, who knows? But no. You want to insulate yourself from future price fluctuations such that you can continue the train on your schedule and not when the financial viability of buying ammo tells you when you're allowed to train. You're going to need to change your life patterns here in a tactical sense. Check the news before you move. Check Google Maps if you're going to drive somewhere. It's pretty good about notifying you where traffic congestions can occur and where coming to a complete stop blocked in by cars on all sides could be a death sentence. Maybe we want to avoid that now more often than not, especially if that congestion is in a suspicious uh, place like, I don't know, downtown. Begin maybe adding 10 minutes to your travel to travel the less traveled, safer air quotes path. You're going to uh, want to have worked out or begin to work out plans with your tight social circle plans, ability to back each other up, tactically, but also financially, or more. Keep tabs on each other. Uh, let let your friends know, hey, I might you know, spend the night at your place if uh, going back from work is not viable to my house, right? The, uh, issues in between you and there. Right? You want comms, both internet, cellular, and backup possible over radio. The list goes on of what you can do to up your chances in this scenario. I've listed a couple things above that are, I don't know, standouts for me, but there's a plethora of things you can do to uh, really up your chances in this super long-term scenario. And it also highly depend on how violent and the type of violence we'll see. So you sort that out, let's move on to some stretch goals. Tactical gear and a real rifle. So like a, like, you know, PD, most PDWs are rifles, but that's NFA bullshit. So a tactical gear and real rifles to support it. So like an AR-15 and good uh, enablers on it. Now, you probably already have this stuff if you're on part three of a video like this, but you're going to want to look to really square that stuff away and potentially have extras, especially the handout or whatever. I put this in the stretch category because I really want to de-emphasize the need for high-end tactical drip and more so talk about the, the, the reality that life still goes on and you're not really going to be running AR-15s every day, all day, right? 
but it's still smart to have, not just for the now of the scenario, but likely what's going to end up precipitating from a scenario like this that just goes on for a while. If you're a business owner, now is the time where you may be the only line of defense uh, of someone showing up to protect that if you come under the line of fire. That means roof Korean status and the memes that are around it. But uh, the memes have an element of truth. There is a real possibility of the requirement or need of community-based defense or show of forces. Even the deployment of something as basic as community watch, which used to be a thing in the 90s if I recall, uh, even because the, the concept of safe part of town might become a cute phrase you once uttered, and the reality is you want people with eyes out at all times. Get your comms gear squared away, make sure your gear has seen the light of day recently. You're not really defending against hordes of zombies or gangs or just hostile squads but we're more so trying to mitigate the effects of a riot or a protest gone riot mode and it's just going ham throughout a local area. We've seen this occur already. So the, the scenario we're discussing is not about you know how, but more so the scale, intensity, and frequency. Community-based defense groups, unfortunately though, have the very real possibility of turning into a murder fest real fucking quick. If you don't have a good game plan, training, discipline, SOPs, rules of engagement, whatever. So make sure if you are going to go this route, have a game plan and a group of people you trust and be very clear on your local laws and what you're allowed to get away with. Right? Just having a rifle and tack gear and the I'm going to hold the line here has a very real possibility of just fucking you over for the rest of your life, however short or long it may be. You're also going to want, just as an addendum, you're going to want a more capable get home bag. Not because you always need to get home and you might need to leave your vehicle at work or something, but also you may just not want to go home. What if between you and home, there's a large kerfuffle going on? And well, perhaps the just chill, go to the Winchester, get a pint and wait for this to all blow over from the comfort of your car maybe makes a lot more sense here. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on to supplies, logisticals, and preps. This is a very vague category for this, but you're going to want one to three months of food, water, etc. Not necessarily because we're planning on riding this out. You won't. This is going to be a long one. But you want to isolate yourself from potentially needing to get food, water, or whatever when the power gas or whatever goes out for a short period of time because everyone else is going to go get food, water, whatever when that happens, and you don't want to join in on that nonsense, right? You can go stock back up later when uh, it's less intense, less worse, whatever. The concept of trying to cross a town in a car to go get dinner uh, is kind of awful if there's an active riot going on and you get a Molotov through the window or something, right? Are you part of the demographic that the people are upset about? Yes, you're going to want to avoid dance, uh, going about when this is occur, uh, when the, the, the spikes of intensity are occurring. But even if you're not, do you really think a angry rioting crowd understands the concept of IF, IFF? Probably not. You're going to want to begin changing your lifestyle beyond basic level self-awareness stuff that I talked about earlier, right? Tactical level self-awareness, like route planning, whatever. You're going to want to change your lifestyle as a whole. That means if you're living paycheck to paycheck, you're kind of in a permanent, you know, flatline, and you're going to want to unfuck that. You want a future plan that elevates yourself such that you can do other things that I'll get into in a second. This means generally, perhaps stop buying that $10 Frappuccino from Starbucks Delight that has more sugar than caffeine. It means stop eating out four times a week, three times a week, two times a week, right? It's, we're allowed to eat out, right? We're allowed to indulge, but eating out is ludicrously expensive ludicrously expensive learn how to cook meal plan whatever if you have debt it's time to get rid of that right i've talked about this before um in the normal times right debt is detrimental in normal times but in a scenario like this being one second away from a blowout if you miss a paycheck that is incredibly dangerous and it basically means you're going to hit a point of no recovery you lost game over Remember, we're not weathering through this crisis. We're living it. Perhaps for a very long time, perhaps for the rest of your life. Get comfortable. Work towards retirement. Work from freeing yourself from the system as much as you can. There is a possibility that something like this 
almost a likelihood that something like this would de-escalate and life would improve. But there's also a possibility that it gets far worse and something worse precipitates out of it. And you want to begin preparing for that. Preparing for that involves, you know, well, a future video, but one years of supplies, water, uh, tack gear, maps, SOPs, planning, training, quality of life stuff, the ability to cook without power, the ability to have you know, function in the mount mountainous environment if you, you know, decide to go up there. Survival skills, power generations, blah, 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 blah. You guys know the drill. And if you don't, that's for a different video, right? Let's get to some stretch goals here, right? This, once again, by no means comprehensive, but let's get to some stretch goals. The goal here is to kind of go beyond survival, right? And to understand that this is our life now. Once again, life now in the scenario, this is absolutely not our life right now. Now, unless you're watching this three years from now and everything did go to shit, hey, sorry. But we're gonna kind of make the assumption here for our stretch goals, okay, this is our new way of living. We're going past survival and we're gonna try to thrive. What does that mean? Well, it means getting out of the cold war zone that are the inner cities. I've been quite anti-moving out of the cities just because because my life is in the city, my friends are in the city, civilization in a lot of ways are in the cities. I don't mind being in the cities, right? I've lived in tiny townas in the middle of Germany. Uh, I understand that lifestyle. I'm all about that lifestyle, but my career, whatever, that's in the city. However, now is when I'm going to say, all right, it's time to leave the city. And uh, it's time to get financially independent and start working towards egressing the city permanently. That means maybe a career path that lets you work remote or a job outside of the city when you have a nice nest egg of finances sorted out. Set yourself up in the countryside, maybe get some livestock. Chickens are great, I love chickens. Growing some food, the usual. I'm not saying exit the grid entirely, like, you know, have full-blown solar and all that, but I'm just saying distance yourself from the, the hot spots that are the city, which is typically where most of this will begin to precipitate at. Thus, fundamentally, this is why I'm a big fan of you need to work hard now, so you're not only financially independent now, you don't have debt, blah, 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 but working on it right now, having an exit strategy known as retirement and retirement with a lot of excess cash is your exit strategy from this reality that we're talking about here today, yeah, right? So just move out of the city, bro, generally doesn't always work for most people. So that means, like I said, financial exit strategy, savings, yada, yada, yada. All right. That was a longer one. Thanks for sticking with it. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this one. I think we did get a little bit off in the weeds here, but this is a complex topic and I don't like leaving things, you know, at the bare minimum. I tried to do a little bit more than the bare minimum and hopefully we did that here today, regardless. But hopefully you got a data point or two out of this. Regardless, thanks for watching. Consider joining up on Subscribestar. Uh, help me keep this mess of a channel going. And you also get access to the podcast uh, that I do with Hoplophile. Most importantly, you keep my dog fat with dog treats. And really, that's all we care about, right? Regardless, thanks for watching. Hopefully this was good for you. Uh, and we'll see you around. Come on. Come on. Are you a dog? No, you've already been fed snacks. You can't have more snacks. Do you disagree with that statement? Snack cited. You've already gotten a snack. Now looking at it doesn't make it come closer. Is this your behaved position? Yeah.